Hey, my travel and podcast. Hey, I'm lucky to have Bree Schaap. How are you today, Bree? Great. How are you doing? Doing excellent. Uh, Bree is an Olympian, which I always love talking to. It's always, I guess, it's always an honor just talking to anybody that's you know the best in the world and best in the nation. So, congratulations on on your past successes. Thank you. You are now you are a athletically. You've been an athlete your basically your whole life. I mean, you went from high school sports into skeleton, into yep. two person bobsled, and then you actually were are now comment being a commentator on the sport. So, how much world travel have you done for sports and athletics? That's the one of the great things. One of the best takeaways uh, from an yeah. athletic career, especially an international one, would be the travel and not just the places you go, but just the cultural immersions, you know, seeing how things are done and the way people live all around the world. I mean, that's been priceless. And more so than that, the friends I've made on tour, because with these niche sports, especially sliding sports, it's a really small group. And, you know, it's it's winter, it's outside, it's cold, and you spend most of your time in what we call the start house. So okay. that's basically, you know, like for downhill skiers, they'll have a little hut at the top of the hill. Yeah. So our start house is where, you know, you spend most of your time, you bring your bags in. So for such a cold sport, you really don't spend that much time outside except for when you're actually on the ice or when you're warming up. So there is a lot of just palling around in the start house, and and it's been so much fun, Uh, just the friendships I've made and then the people that I've gone on to uh, coach with uh, once being done. You know, there's always – there's a bed for you all over the world, and that's one of the best parts. (laughs) Well, yeah, and I I left out that you you were coaching for several years after being a competitor as well, so, I mean – Yep, uh, coaching the emerging nations for the International Bobsled and Skeleton Federation. So that includes uh, the nations that don't have a big program. So Jamaica, Brazil, Australia, yeah. all the countries that qualify for some assistance, as well as para bobsled and para skeleton, which is the adaptive sports version of sliding sports that unfortunately we did not get into the Paralympics um, for Beijing coming up here, which was a bummer. We thought we had qualified everything we needed, uh, but looking to the next games in 2022. Wow. So a couple of questions. The skeleton is where you're, you're on a, just a sled going down face first and probably getting what, 70, 80 miles an hour. Yeah, depending on the track, all the tracks yeah. are different and yeah. conditions are always different. So on an on on an ideal day, skeleton is one of these slower sliding sports, but it feels faster because your teeth are on the ice. <laughs> You're <what>, four <laughs> inches off the ice. Yeah. One of the questions that I, I wanted to ask you is, how do you um, control that? Is it just with your hands and leaning your body? Yeah, the uh, skeleton is. Um, I would say, you know by far and away the least controlled sliding sport. So you do have a lower center of gravity. However, you, the sled is built out of, you've got steel runners, which are the, you know, blades per se on the bottom, but really the, if you look at them closely, the front part, the top part, what's under your shoulders is round. So you only have a little bit of a spine that then the runner turns into a little bit of a knife on the back end that you push your knees in to steer the sled. So what's cool about skeleton is Because you are your sled, essentially, the more relaxed and the more melted into that sled you are, the faster you'll go. If you think about force going down a track, if you are bouncing around, then you're going to slow yourself down. So you really melt into that sled. And any any subtle movement on a skeleton sled is going to steer it. So you develop all these interesting ways to steer, you know, depending on the type of corner, if you're in a straightaway or at faster speeds, you know, even just a little look of your head is going to steer the sled. But for really aggressive steers, you're pushing your knees and your shoulders or maybe even dropping a toe on the ice and mind you you're not steering left or right you're controlling g-force so when we talk about steering and sliding sports it's kind of like race car driving where yeah. you get into a corner and you're more looking to manipulate that g-force um, to either accelerate your sled or just prevent yourself from eating it out of a corner <laughs> which sounds excellent <laughs> until you're doing yeah. it <laughs> Yeah, yep. there's definitely, oh, I've had some hairy, hairy uh, crashes in skeleton. The skeleton crashes, crashes, I would say, were definitely worse than bobsled ones because you're really? totally exposed. Except in bobsled, you do have, you finish the course, right? It's all downhill. So there is no just stopping and starting over. So wherever yeah, yeah. you crash, then, you know, you're taking it the rest of the way down. In a bobsled, though, you've got, the sleds weigh between 400 and 500 pounds. And once you're over, they don't necessarily right themselves. And so you're in the sled, but your head is on the ice the whole rest of the way that you're up on the vertical corners. 
So the brakemen are far more exposed. Yeah, I was going to say, you're the driver, so you're looking at it, whereas the brakeman's just down going, I hope she doesn't crash. Yeah, it's funny as a brakeman. Well, not funny. A brakeman would hate me for saying that, but <laughs> you kind of the more the longer you do it, you get this feeling of like you know that if you experience weightlessness for more than one second, you're like, it's oh, bad. oh no, <laughs> we're, it's over, we're we're done. And sometimes brakemen will do uh, what we call kicking out because rather than take the rest of the course on their head, they'll kick oh. out of the sled and they'd rather take those ice burns um, than the beating the rest of the way, but it's really dangerous. You have to know the tracks very well and know what yeah, corners are coming where up. Um, yeah, exactly. Cause that can, we, we, te- we tend not to recommend that because it can be super dangerous. I know one athlete kicked out in the huge corner called shady two in Lake Placid and his, uh, spike, he was a newer brakeman and a spike caught in the ice and he broke his leg. Yeah. I'm not selling it. <laughs> to well, you know, it- out there. <laughs> Well, your, your crashes sound I, – I talked to Valerie Thompson, who's the world's fastest oh. female motorcycle racer. Yeah. And she was the only person to ever survive a crash over 300 miles an hour. Whoa. And she crashed, like, at 300 and, I think, 65 miles an hour, and and she slid for over a mile on the salt track. Wow. Was it – did she end up wearing through what her protective gear? Did she end yeah. up uh, on skin? No, no. Uh, she, uh, when you're going that fast, they put them. It's not a real motorcycle. I mean, it, well, it is, but it's basically got a tube, and oh, so she's in clothes. Right, right. Okay. And uh, she said uh, she that you know the front wheel hit 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 a rut, bounced up, came down on the side, and she slid for over a mile. And you know she wow. got knocked out and came came back by the time she she was alert before she even came to a finish. Oh wow! But, but still holding it, but still um, covered by the bike even though she's yeah, knocked out. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's so. crazy. Yeah, we do wear Kevlar burn vests and bobsled because an ice burn, when you're going 90 miles an hour, ice feels like concrete. And so um, they make these specialty burn vests. And Kevlar is not easy to get a hold of. So there's only a few places that we can get them for the sport. And um, that protects mostly the brakemen. Typically, drivers are a bit more enclosed by what's called the cowling, the front of the sled. But yep. the brakemen, they are sitting in the sure. back. Their entire back is exposed. And so I've seen not only can you get a really bad ice burn, but you risk infection after that. And so I've had a few teammates with holes in their shoulders from uh, ice burns getting infected. Wow. See, that's the stuff you'll never see because, you know, like you <laughs> said, it's a, it's a sport you only hear about every couple of years when the Olympics come around. And so when, yeah. you know, when the Olympics are over, you're not hearing about the people that have crashed or the training, you know, injuries. Yeah. Uh, and it's, but that, that said, the, biggest risk of injury in sliding sports is typically overtraining. And I, if we went yep. and um, analyzed all the injuries, most of um, most of what sends an athlete either to sports med or to the hospital per se is going to be overtraining. So for me, like, yes, I, I had a few hits and a few concussions, but my bigger injuries were from uh, high volume squat phase where I tore my labrum in my hip and had to get hip surgery. Um, stuff like that is, is typically what's going to get a sliding sports athlete because it's so heavily focused on speed and strength. The cool part is you get to see what athletes from other sports, how much potential the human body has when you only focus on strength and speed. Um, it's amazing to see what, you know, already strong football players, what they can come and achieve when they, you know, aren't getting hit necessarily. Yeah. Well, scratch that when they're only getting hit like five months out of the year, <laughs> you know, on a, on the ice, but a bit less. And the same with females, like the women's bobsled is really unique in that you're looking for big, strong, powerful women, which there aren't that many uh, sports that cater to. It makes it difficult to recruit. But once we get athletes in, you'll see gains. Like when I switched from skeleton to bobsled, my squat max went up well over 100 pounds just by focusing that much on strength, recovery, and and being really academic about it. That's <laughs> insane. Yeah. yeah. Because I, I, I saw one of your past interviews where you, you had said that it's, it's difficult to recruit. And, you know, because in lacrosse, women's lacrosse is just picking up, especially on the West Coast. It's been big, you know, Maryland and back East, Massachusetts and all that. But it, it, we were pulling, trying to pull from uh, soccer players. Yeah. And, and then also trying to get some of the volleyball players that are taller and, you know, and good eye-hand coordination. And But it, you're right, it's, it's – and my daughter, my youngest, came from softball, so it was nice. It's interesting that that sliding sports. Like, where would you pull from? Because I mean, bobsled yeah. ball pushing. 
Yep. I mean, yeah. And well, and that eye hand coordination is um, is a key that you mentioned. So a brakeman's yeah. sole job might be pushing, but a driver is pushing and also steering. And so you're making decisions that I mean, not only is it you know you're connecting your hands, you have to great have a great feel for, it, and it, this takes time. But the runners underneath the sled, underneath the bobsled, are connected through a suspension to D rings uh, that are attached by ropes to that suspension, and you're pulling left and right. So the front the front runners pivot left and right, and that's what you're using to grab that g-force like i mentioned in skeleton Mm -hmm. and so what's interesting about that is you're going so fast you are not driving by sight you're driving by what you rehearse in your mind your mind runs typically only get two to three runs a day which is you know 120 seconds of practice a day so a lot of it is visualization and training the back of your brain uh, brain to react and of course experience and experiencing it enough to know all the if and scenarios of what to do so if you see something coming down the track making a decision you're gonna you know then a hundred you know meters have passed or you know it's it's yeah or 20 you know one second is gonna be you know like yeah 30 30 meters and so you're just training your reactions and it's been fascinating recruiting and coaching the uh what we call the emerging nations because depending on the culture if they don't have a lot of eye hand coordination sports um it makes it a lot tougher to adapt to that steering in your hands because they probably do a lot of soccer yeah or running. Yep. Yeah, running exactly. So, and then for some, you know, what's interesting coaching the Jamaicans is a lot of them um, come from very poor areas of Jamaica where uh, there's um, one kid I was coaching had never driven a car before, and yet he was a top Jamaican pilot. <laughs> Go figure. Yeah. That, that, you know, for you, like having the, the volleyball background was probably good for the eye hand coordination, though. Yeah, in explosiveness as well. We have definitely have had success yeah. recruiting volleyball players. Um, uh, Lauren Gibbs, who just won a silver medal with Alana Myers at the 2018 Olympics, uh, she played volleyball at Brown, and one of our other top brakemen, Katie Eberling, prior to that, um, played at Northwestern, I believe. So it's explosive power, I would say, is almost more important than if you're going to separate you know, speed and strength. But the ability to explode is going to – pushing a sled is really interesting. You're accelerating – you know, a 400 pound object over ice. But once you get it going, then the start starts to go downhill. So you have to have the top end speed to be able to keep accelerating the sled. Does the benefit, I was wondering this, does the benefit being taller or shorter? Uh, It depends, you know, it just depends on how fast you are, I guess, because you would think, we typically would think, uh, being taller is a benefit because then you have a really long stride but really turnover is going to be most important so kind of like Uh Usain Bolt right if you've got a tall athlete with fast turnover great but one of the best brakemen we've ever had was Lauren Williams who was a silver medalist in the uh, I think in the Athens games in the 100 100 meters and I've you know never met uh, a faster human in my life and so for someone like Lauren it didn't matter that um, she's, you know, five foot two because she is so unbelievably ballistic uh, that she's going to get that sled going. So, what, what's how? How do you get? And this is one of the things I, I've just always wondered. How do you get a five hundred pound bobsled back up the hill? Do they have? Do they put it on the cart and just <laughs> the drive other, it up? The other non glamorous uh, side of the sport. So yeah. uh, it depends on the track, but typically um, you you stick it in kind of an adapted pickup truck. So you okay. you first of all you turn the sled over on its side because runners are very expensive. We'll spend between uh, five thousand to ten thousand dollars on the runners, the steels right. underneath the sled alone, yeah. and so you really want to protect those. So you finish the run, the brakeman pulls the brakes, you turn the sled on its side, you pull it off the ice, and then you put it into what we call scabbards. These are the um, big metal kind of shoes that protect the runners and then you slide it onto the back of typically a pickup truck ideally one that has a cover over it because it's really cold outside then you get (laughs) on the back of the truck and you ride up the hill with it totally exposed so the scabbards um, are just like what ice skaters use right I mean, yep, thing. exactly. Yep, yeah. same principle, but uh, in this instance, you know, um, 15 plus feet long. So we have yeah, had some huge. issues depending on how well the roads are maintained. Uh, we have lost bobsleds out of the back of a truck, lost skeleton mm-hmm. athletes and their sleds out of the back of a truck. It is certainly not glamorous, and the camera rarely follows people back up on that side. <laughs> I know that's what that's like. I said those are the questions I've always kind of looked at it and I wonder yep be, and then you get to the it, top and you yank that sled off again and put it on the ice at the top pull the scabbards off yeah it's it's not an efficient sport by any means the only efficient <laughs> part of it is getting down the hill in the sled exactly 
Exactly. You know, you brought NASCAR drivers, and I've talked to a, a couple of them now. Do, do you have uh, 3D simulators? They've, you know, that, that's something that they've tried to come up with throughout the years. Um, I know, you know, video games have had that in their Olympic packages. Um, and it's one of those things that, uh, yes, you can use that, but a feel is so much a part of it. And you also need, as I've, as I've noticed, the adrenaline is a really important yeah. aspect to learning. So you can do, they have that in Lake Placid as kind of a virtual experience, but you need to be able to feel the different variables in the ice, and that would be really difficult to program into a simulator. And as I've learned in sliding sports, there is nothing that trains your brain faster than total fight or flight fear for your life. And so it's fascinating <laughs> yeah. where even in just a couple runs a day, those mistakes are burned into your limbic brain, and you will dream about them. And especially if you crash, you will not make that same mistake again. Oh, no, I hear you. Uh, the, the one uh, – NASCAR driver I talked to said that the main thing that they practice the most on is uh, the, the pit areas because yeah. uh, of, of, you know, depending on if they're going to be in the front, middle or back end of the pit lane and then coming in and out. But I just curious, that'd be interesting if you could, cause I just did, I just experienced, I don't know if you've done any of the, uh, the VR with the goggles on your head where yeah. you're, in, you're in totally 360 immersion. And, uh, that would be interesting if you could do because you would get some of the feel and some of the – because I was standing. I did the uh, the Macau bungee jump in 3D, yeah. and I, 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 I have vertigo. So I was kind of like – I started – my brain's going, you're standing in a bar. There's nothing around you. But I had this thing on, and you could look in every direction. And I was on the platform, and then she jumped, so I jumped. And it was like, whoa. <laughs> so yeah, I just wanted it's, to it's do a- something like that. It's tough because you really need the feedback in real time, right? Because yeah, there's yeah. so many variables coming down the track that, you know, if one entrance is off, that could um, just have this, that's going to have a chain effect of maybe it, this, sometimes the turns are in like sections. And so depending on the track, if you mess up one corner, that's going to mess up this chain of four corners down. And so it would take some intensive programming to, to so know that, mainly yeah. it's good for rehearsal, right? So you can rehearse your steers. But even then, you're also having to rehearse every possible scenario. scenario. So, you know, say I take a little bump out of a corner, it sends me late into the next corner, then I need to be ready with an emergency steer to get back on track. It's, uh, but, it, you know, even just those rehearsals, though, is great for mostly anxiety management, to be honest. You know, you see yeah, athletes yeah. look like they're playing a virtual game. If you watch the Olympics and you'll see the shots of um, drivers warming up, they'll typically stop intermittently through their warm-up <clears throat> to – to do what looks like, you know, they're playing a VR game and they're just rehearsing their steers down the track. And I found that, you know, it just helps you feel more prepared because your body's going to react how it's going to react. And so it was sure. mostly good for anxiety management. Yeah. And we did the same thing in lacrosse. Like when I was coaching the girls in lacrosse, it was, you know, we, they do penalty shots and we, we had championship games that came down to them. Yeah. And you just wanted to do so many that your body kind of just knew what to do and you were just focused on you know, maybe a top exactly. right shot or a bottom yeah. right shot. Yeah, and when people are watching games, you know, and you're seeing a kicker come in for football and, you know, in yeah. a spectator is thinking, man, that is so much pressure for one person, but you just make it your specialty. You know, standing at the top of a bobsled track, you know, at the Olympics, you've really only got one shot. You can't mess up a single heat of the four heats in that race and so you're just getting it down to a science and and sticking to your to your routine so that your body goes on autopilot in those scenarios but that said i mean the olympics are um so much more intense than any other competition scenario just the energy in even the entire city is palpable so for athletes at their first olympics it's definitely a learning curve the 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 one question i i I would I had so many. I told you before when, when we first met, but I love sliding sports. So yeah, I always wondered, like, if if you're a bobsledder, I mean, you're talking fractions of a second between a goal, a medal, and 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 not. So when you when you Tell hit, me about a, it. If, yeah, <laughs> if you hit, if you're up at the top and you hit, you know, the second or third turn, and you're you're off, and you know you hit it wrong, do you just kind of go, ugh, because you know you're you're not gonna, or are you fighting going and then try and make it back? You know, down at the bottom. 
you know, sometimes that puts you into, um, it's interesting because that can like almost literally knock you, knock you into a different zone where you know yeah. you have zero room for a mistake. And so sometimes you'll take a hit at the top and the risk there, the problem is it's a velocity sport. You know, there's no engine. You're counting on the velocity you have from the start and trying to multiply it down the track. So if you take a hit up high, that kills your velocity and you're trying to make up for it. So, but that said, you oftentimes will then just go into this hyper focus mode and have a perfect run after that. Uh, but still, at the same time, at the Olympics, at top level competition, um, that will usually take someone out of the race. But that also doesn't factor in equipment and um, technology and start time. So if you have a faster start time than everyone yeah, else, that's where we're always trying to recruit bigger, faster, stronger athletes. So if you can get an edge on a competitor by 500, we generally say that that multiplies by three down the track. So that, in theory, would give you a 1,500th advantage over your competitors and give you a little bit more <laughs> wiggle room if you make that mistake. I, I love talking to you. Because, <laughs> yeah, that's, so many nuances. Yeah, I mean, and, 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 I, and I understand, like, you know, when you're commentating in the Olympics, you know, you're, you're trying to do a broad stroke of, you know, of people that haven't heard of the sport versus more of the, the nuances, like you said. You don't have a lot of time, too. It's very much um, a dance between you and your co-commentator because each run takes about 90 seconds. It's a 60-second run, and then you've got maybe 15 seconds before and after for setup. You have to keep it in quick sound bites. So I've gotten really trained and yeah. uh, you know, not really allowed to talk longer than 20 seconds, which makes it very <laughs> difficult to squeeze in highly technical information. I think I would. I would. I don't think. I mean, I guess I'd get better at it. But I'd love my long format podcast where I can spend, you know, twenty, thirty minutes with somebody and really yeah. get to know. Them. Yeah, I know. It'd be nice. the The other part, what's interesting, is doing uh, working with NBC and doing some of the other like video analysis or visuals. We'll have you know certain segments that I'll shoot that I can uh, fit in there, mm -hmm. but they still have to be short because it's such a dynamic broadcast and you want the bulk of it to be the sleds on the track. And so um, you know, and it gets overwhelming for me in wanting so bad to promote this sport. They're like, okay, Brie, can you say, you know, a little slower, a little bit less. I'm like, oh, but I could go for an hour. <laughs> really tough. But I, I, I'm like, I how about I just talk faster and say more? <laughs> I think your idea of the podcast would be great though. Yeah, you can go into the nuances of different sports. And then um, something we were talking about earlier before recording is I'm the second vice chair of the U.S. Uh, Olympic and Paralympic Committee's Athletes Advisory Council, which is kind of the essentially the union reps for the different sports. And so we've talked about starting our own podcast and have, and then you could have the different representatives from each different sport, not only talking about their sports, but their issues that they have with the governance there. Well, and, and just giving people more insight. I mean, I, I don't. I think that's the beauty of, of social media now is you could really, yeah. you could share things that most people. Yeah, you know, I was talking uh, Casey Patterson, the volleyball player, and yeah. he's he's heavy in, into social media, and that's how, you know, he's getting sponsorships because of it, which is huge for an athlete that doesn't make a lot of money. You know, I mean. They, they yeah, if you can grow your following, you can get a nice uh, – the, even uh, some of our skeleton athletes that aren't necessarily top tier, they've grown enough of a following that they can get some passive income from it. It's been yeah. huge for athletes. But the problem there then is even if you can gain some sponsors, one of the big subjects right now in athlete advocacy is Rule 40. It's an international rule from the Internet, the IOC, the International Olympic Committee, which, you know, answer. track and field – yeah, yeah, track and field is um, who hates this rule the most, where you're not allowed to – um, show or talk about your own sponsors for this, what they call the blackout period of the Olympic Games. Yeah. And so it makes it very difficult for an athlete to make money off of their own likeness during that time period. And I know they're doing that with the um, California just passed that thing about the, the college that's athletes. Been, yep, that's been huge for that uh, helps us as um, athlete representatives with the movement of pushing yeah. for this saying, okay, you've had free labor for long enough now. How about allow, How about allowing the athletes to make some money or have a little bit more wiggle room based on their own likeness as other people are making money off of them. It's the same thing with the Olympic athletes. I mean, you know, and I know Vias is a great sponsor and uh, some of the other big, big sponsors, but I mean, and I don't know this for a fact at all, but right now in between Olympics, I don't think Vias is sponsoring too many sliding athletes to make it through. Maybe they are. I don't know. Yeah, specific. Well, it's 
Correct, right? So they sponsor the U.S. Olympic and Paralympic Committee, and that money goes towards athlete programs. And so the sliding sports, while the athletes might not see that by stipend, you can earn a stipend, which goes through the USOPC. Okay. Um, but that's going to be more indirect by if that money is going into sports med, into sport performance, and the other ways that uh, – so say you're living at a training center, you're going to see more of that than if you're uh, you know, off in Remote, Southern California. Right in training on your own and training remote. Um, but that funding also then might go to your NGB, which is your national governing body, your sport organization, and that might then be contributing to your travel based on their high performance plan. So yes, it's interactive visa. You know, those big sponsors do take on individual athletes, which is a huge opportunity for them. But again, that's, that's not, there's so many more athletes in the movement than that. So this is an opportunity to trick yours, figuring out yeah. what works for the big sponsors. You know, if you look at golf, you know, you have the major sponsors and then each athlete still is allowed to wear their own sponsor um, gear and, yeah, exactly. and yeah, just finding that happy medium where, you know, the athletes are able, especially in Olympic sports, just to earn a bit more of a livable income for the sport that they've chosen. Well, I know uh, MMA fighters, I, I, I know someone personally, well, they kind of got deuced over by, by the UFC when they changed their sponsoring programs because fighters used to make more money, and I mean a lot more money, from their sponsors if, if they could wear, you know, their tap-out sh- shorts into the, into yeah. the rink. And, they're and not then, allowed to anymore. No, UFC uh, said everything's Reebok now. Wow, and that's the model. That's the IOC model, and this actually – um, not to be a bit of a history nerd, but this was started by the U.S. Olympic Committee back, I believe it was the 84 games, that changed the paradigm. And that the, all of a sudden, Olympic sports were a money-making machine when yeah. you made it exclusive sponsorship rights. So then the IOC saw that, and they're like, wait a minute, they were not happy that the U.S. was making that much money then off the Olympics. So they went with the same model, and now you have kind of this monster that's gotten a bit out of control, and we're trying to figure out, you know, how do you keep that kind of money in the sport? But also allow athletes you know to make some money off of them off of their own likeness and we did just have the rules it was announced the usopc is relaxing some of the rule 40 regulations for these next summer olympics coming up in 2020 so athletes will be allowed to um they'll be allowed a certain number of thank yous that they can put on social media to their personal sponsors they won't necessarily be able to wear them you can wear a personal sponsor if it's competitive gear so like if you have a specific shoe then typically you can wear your shoe sponsors but the logo has to be a certain size (laughs) yeah I i swear that's all the stuff no one would ever know about yeah, so we were at the Olympics in 2010, and it was Under Armour's first foray into Olympic gear. And they, uh, as a U.S. bobsled and skeleton sponsor, made the loudest, starriest, most American um, gear for us. And uh, But one of the – maybe it was a mistake, maybe it wasn't, but a lot of the logos were a bit too big on that gear. So we were being chased down by officials um, all throughout <laughs> the games trying to put tape over logos that were too big. Which, which is fun and interesting to me because it only makes me look at the logo more now. Yeah, yeah, I go, exactly. What are they, what are they oh, covering up was... the tape? Yeah, so, yeah. Maybe they did that on purpose. Yeah, I mean, it's the same thing that you'll see uh, in film production when you have to Greek out something, oh, yeah. you know, that you don't have permission for. I mean, so they're running around Greeking out athletes. <laughs> you know, I, I was talked to um, – one of the guys I talked to on my show was uh, um, Dave Eichinger, and he works for New Era Baseball Caps. And huh. they they make all the caps for uh, baseball and football, the NFL oh. and MLB. And he said everything you see. He goes when I watch a he goes when I watch a baseball game, everything's about money. He goes we yeah. have done an analysis of how many balls are hit in every park. So he they know how many ball how many foul balls go to left field versus right field, how many balls are going to left center. So that's where they want to place their logos. And that's how they wow. they they discuss. He and goes, I mean, every- that's really the crux of it, right? Is um, it all does come down to money. And the interesting thing about Olympic sports is you still have the athletes buying into the idea that it's bigger, that it's about something more. And that's certainly how it's yeah. sold to the public. Yeah. 
Um, whereas, I mean, that's part of the problem is the athletes agreeing like, oh, yeah, I should do this for free. Sure, it's, it's you know, this is um, a country. valiant effort. Yeah, for my country. Um, but in the, in the meantime, then you finish and you retire and you're kind of scratching your head going, hold, hold on, wait a minute. You know, I, mean, I wonder if that was such a great use of my time because now I'm, you know, 10, 15, maybe 20 years behind other um, people my age that have gotten so far in their career. You know, and, and this kind of, I kind of knew it would go this way. I talked to Landon Turner, who's a, a NFL football player. He's, he's, God, he's the same age as my daughter. I think he's four months older than my daughter. And he's retired. Yeah. And he goes, he told me on the podcast, he goes, I'm jealous of all my, my classmates. He goes, they're jealous of me because I was playing on the New Orleans Saints and the Carolina Panthers and Seattle Seahawks. He goes, but now I'm jealous of them because they've had five or six years of work experience that I never had. He yep. goes, so now that I'm done with my, my football career, I've never, I, I didn't have a job in college. I was an All-American, you know, team captain, so you had to do the off-season stuff and all that. Yeah. Right into being a pro. And he goes, you know, I make, he goes, I make good money, but I didn't make, you know, not everybody makes Cam Newton money. Not everyone makes Michael no, Phelps exactly. money. No, exactly. And I think a lot of people, exactly, people don't recognize that, you know, NFL doesn't mean you're rich. Uh, yeah. Olympic sports especially does not mean, just because it, they might see you competing on television every two or four years does not mean you're making money. Right. And then, like you said, you know, you didn't, you had to train, so you weren't getting work experience. So, yeah. I, I, do, and, you have and it's interesting, too. It's that on top of... Um, not really, you're living in a different bubble, in a different world. And granted, you're choosing this bubble and you're creating this bubble and it's reinforced mm-hmm. by your coaches and your family and the public. Um, but one of the more shocking things that uh, we're finding for athletes when they transition is just that life is not black and white. The luxury of sports is you are in a linear lifestyle where, you know, A plus B is, has the best chance of getting C. And you can, you know, just keep marching in that straight line of, like, if I wanted to make a comeback and go to the Olympics, I know every single thing that I would need to do that. Now, if I wanted to start a business, I'm getting on Google and I'm seeing all these different things and i not even necessarily understanding business culture. Um, and it's, it's – uh, it's humbling isn't the right word. I would almost say embarrassing <laughs> because you feel so yeah. far behind yeah. and um, just normal life in the gray area of it all is so overwhelming for athletes. Like all, all of just this struggling to really understand what it means to leave, lead a life that has, you know, meaning and value and passion when of course you've been living your passion. You know, that's the thing that's, toughest you know when people tell athletes or with anyone struggling you just got to find your passion well for most athletes they did it the good thing is it has an expiration date so you are forced to discover something new about yourself than what yeah. you had thought was your most valuable asset all this time uh, and i'm sure you've seen other athletes uh really do well afterwards and then some people really struggle yeah, and it's and it's so nuanced. I remember I was surveying everyone I knew, all the athletes uh, that have retired, asking for a specific time frame. Like in my head, when I retired in 2014, I felt like there was some, you know, uh, like nine months. You know, I was expecting people yeah. to tell me, you know, one year, a year and a half. This is the exact amount of time that it takes to recover and move on, and you know, figure out who you are if you're not an athlete. But this existential dilemma, it's so different for everyone depending on maybe what the reasons you got into sport, how you retired, um, the yeah. circumstances of moving on, whether it was injury, if it was your choice or not. You know, a lot of times the elite athletes are going to want to ride it out as long as you can because it's so much fun. Um, but at the same time, the longer you do a sport, the higher chance there is of getting injured and then ending not on your terms. And then also on top of that, not feeling supported through that injury uh, and at the end of that yeah. life cycle. So which can create, you know, a lot of anger, a lot of resent. And one of the fascinating things, there was a, an Olymp- uh, there was a U.S. Olympians reunion uh, in Las Vegas a few years ago. And I met a woman um, that was supposed to be on, I think it was the 1980 Olympics that were boycotted, that the athletes yeah. were forced to boycott. And she said that that was the first time she'd been able to stomach coming back around the movement because all this time she had just been struggling with the anger and resentment of what happened because she knew she was a diver and she made the Olympic team by the skin of her teeth. She knew she wouldn't be able to go another four years and make the next one. And her only shot was taken away from her. Um, 
So they're definitely, I know the NFLPA, a lot of the professional sports are really great about um, transition programs, but it's really better. individual. Yeah, and I, well, yeah, exactly. And I think the the biggest thing is helping athletes understand in the in the business aspect, you have to convince athletes Convincing athletes that this is the greatest thing you will ever do in your entire life helps them put it all on the line and risk their bodies completely. And I think we're moving into an era where you'll, you're seeing NFL players retire sooner because they don't want to live, um, you know, their life with uh, brain injuries or physical other body injuries that are going to affect, you know, the ideally a much longer period of time. So, can you know, starting to try and approach it with more of a this is a stepping stone to something else but it's a very cool opportunity and not trying to convince athletes that this is the end all be all to their lives yeah i mean i i, I could not agree more i mean and the nfl players i mean i i knew some of them back you know i'm, I'm older i'm old but they were not taken care of back in the day you know back in even yeah. in the 70s and the 80s and because some lived by me and i knew some of them uh through different things and you know, once they were done, they were done, but yet they're dealing with, you know, some of it, some of it was post-traumatic, you know, stress. You know, you, you yeah, get, it is in a sense, really. I mean, and back then, you know, I, I like the way I played football back in the 80s, you can't play anymore. You know, I mean, I was literally coach, right. lead with lead with your helmet, <laughs> you know. Yeah, so, yeah. My my dad played football in college, and uh, and my my grandpa actually as well played. My grandpa played football at Washington State University during the time that they switched over from leather helmets to plastic helmets. Yeah. Um, and he said that they were having a, a in the locker room. Everyone was bouncing their new helmets off the ground, going, "Look at how high these things bounce." Um, and if, and of course, it just now we're only discovering, especially, you know, if you're looking at women's soccer, the explosion of women's soccer, now oh, you're going to yeah. have a lot more athletes and Brandy Chastain. I know a lot of athletes have started to speak up about, um, residual issues with head trauma and yep. how that's had an impact on their life. That's one thing I've been scared about is, um, like wondering sometimes at night, like, is my brain calcifying and dying out from underneath my skull from all those hits I took in Bob's bobsled? I always, I, I always joke with my wife. She's like, "Well, you took a lot of hits in ten years of football." I'm like, what? 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 Sorry. What? What? Sorry, we have trouble. I was afraid this was going to happen. I'm so sorry. Hold on just a second. This is what editing's for, right? <laughs> I like it. Uh, sorry about that. No, oh, good. and now I've got a puppy running into the house. Um, <laughs> <laughs> my my I, dog uh, is sleeping, watching me, waiting for me to get done. So. Yeah. Yeah, so, sorry. Uh, no, I'll wrap it up. Uh, no, no. Um, if if you want, to just give me just a, a minute here. Well, yeah, yeah. the circuit should. Uh, leave. Oh, thank you. Cool. Thanks. Sorry. <laughs> All right, I'll, I'll talk to you later. Sorry about that. All right. Hugs and kisses. That. Yeah. That's the one thing I like about having a recorded show because this will literally yeah. get edited out. <laughs> yeah. No, I was I was no. hoping that. Um, there's just no this. Got a guard dog on duty here. He's going to go ballistic at any sound, let alone yeah. a visitor. <laughs> um, Meryl actually uh, accidentally put her private email out on the show. So I had to delete Oh, that. no. <laughs> I'm like, she goes, um, can you delete that? I'm like, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, like I said, that's the great thing about edited show. So one of the things I was – also wondering, like with the sliding sports, and you know, and being a coach, I, you know, and you already know I'm a fan of the curling, but yeah, uh, how much of, of diet? I mean, now that you're getting into, I mean, hyper performance, you know, how, how important is diet when you're when you're going to different countries? Are you bringing all all your own food, or are you just kind of I don't know how it's set up at the Olympics. I don't know. You have to bring. You know, it's this is something that I would have given you a different answer at nearly every year and stage of my career, yeah. and including now looking back, um, because of course when you're looking uh, to elevate performance and you've been involved in the sport, you make the biggest gains at the beginning, right? So my biggest. Yep. Um, improvements in sliding sports were of course the first couple of years but the longer you're into something and when you're looking for a tenth of a second a hundredth of a second you're trying to find every little bit of an advantage and food does 
uh, eventually become a tool for most people, you know, to the degree that I took it. Um, I was definitely, I got into performance dieting and when I transitioned to bobsled because I knew I needed to get bigger. I knew I needed to gain 20 to 30 pounds in order to compete um, with the the rest of that field. And so the problem is when you, when you pass that, of once food becomes a tool, there's it's very difficult to come back and uh, really recover from that uh, and have a normal relationship with food. I'll never forget when I retired in 2014, um, I was working on NBC. The One of our production assistants was a friend of mine uh, who was Olympian in luge, and she'd watch me because I was still on this ketogenic um, it was back in uh, 2014, one of our big experiences that year, that year with my other teammates is our trainer had us on a, a keto diet with um, high heavy starch uh, recovery loading. And so I, of course, because that had honed such a performance um, through, uh, because it had helped me so much, I took that to the Olympic commentary with me. And so I was still trying to do keto in Russia you know, with broadcast <laughs> yeah. catering. And my friend Ashley was like, you just need to eat normal. And I was like, I don't even know what that is anymore. What is normal? You know, it's, it's whatever works for you. And yeah. uh, I found it was great. Actually, I will say um, in 2013, I was very concerned with my brain health after so many years in sliding sports. Sure, and I will sure. say that the keto diet um, made my brain feel sharp. I think it's great for inflammation for females. I question if it's good long term because it did um, mess with my hormone profile mm-hmm. enough uh, to kind of have me. Uh, this might be TMI, but um, my estrogen was went menopausal for about yeah. uh, a year and a half, and this is at you know 32 years old. So um, it's definitely a risk, and I'm not sure it's something long term. But performance wise, you know, I found it was great for my brain. And so then I did pack um, a bunch of food. I had an entire checked bag of food that I brought with me to the Sochi games to commentate. Um, and I had a whole bunch of, I was uh, sponsored by Bulletproof at the time. And so I had all this yeah. um, butter with me because I was doing the Bulletproof coffee and they confiscate, they actually had a sticker that of, um, it was like TSA inspected sticker that they put on my butter <laughs> that I had brought and, uh, and I had all these snacks that I had made. Um, and then and while competing, I, I went through seasons where like the Olympic year in 2010, I traveled with my own um, skillet and in order to try and yeah, keep with that. my diet. But, you know, for winter sports, especially sliding sports, you're traveling to all these little tiny towns, winter resorts in Europe. And so, and you're all, you get to a point where it's so high stress that you're just trying to, um, to get by. And, and of course, if you come back from the track cold and hungry and you're presented with a six course uh, meal up in the Alps of Italy, you're going to eat, you know, every bit of it and just recognize like, okay, the closest I've ever come to being disqualified from a race uh, <laughs> is when we race in Italy and be aware of that and maybe take some weight out of the sled and allow for those fluctuations. Uh, and, and looking back, I think um, there was a more balanced approach, but of course, you know, at the time you're doing whatever it takes you, you're also trying to manage that guilt and uh, you worry as an athlete about regret. Like, well, I regret this if I don't, you know, that's what gets athletes. Yeah. Um, and that's what's such a high risk of injury is feeling like I need to finish this workout because my competitors are doing it too. And they might be working harder than me. And that's, you know, they take it too far and suddenly getting hip surgery. So it's uh, I, I, I would, you know, if I, if I could go back, I would just try and, um, you know, pat myself on the back and just say, Hey, chill, you know, chill out a little bit. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's just food. Eat when you're hungry. Don't let, um, this become a source of, um, guilt and shame, but that's of course just uh sports culture. Um, everyone's looking at each other, sizing each other up. It's very normal in bobsled uh, and, and in most sports, like you come back for the fall and everyone's just commenting on each other's bodies. Like, Oh, you gain weight. Oh, you lean up. What are you weighing now? You know? Um, so weird. it's, it's a weird, yeah, it's definitely a, a weird arena track and field, especially, um, training with a track coach and having, um, a lot of track and field athletes come in as teammates. Um, they were excited not to have to diet cause they the theme there is fat don't fly. And so, uh, especially for sprinters, um, they get really tired of dieting. Well, uh, MMA fighters too. Yep. You know, yeah. They, they, and that one is such so a fluctuation. Now when you're trying to make weight, oh, um, and, then, and the I, other 
population I have a lot of concerns about is uh, NFL linemen. You know, I've trained uh, one of the gyms I trained at actually was out of Scottsdale, Scottsdale, and there was a lot of NFL linemen there. And um, just hearing about the diets, and you know, one one guy was um, supposed to eat a pound of meat at every meal, and it's like you can just see, um, you, know, you just look at him, and you're like, oh, your poor digestive system, like that's awful. You know, not only trying to recover from injury, but trying to find a normal relationship with food after. And a lot of the, 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 the some of the NFL players I've talked to, I'll say it's the same thing. Like they're linemen, and they'll lose 30, 40 pounds when they retire because yeah, they're just yeah. so they're they're eating four to six thousand, eight thousand calories a day. Exactly, you know, and it's it's so much. I mean, luckily. Uh, and, you know, hopefully they don't do that for that long because it's so tough on the system. I recently did an event with a retired lineman and everybody, one of the first questions people ask because he had lost about 50 pounds and, um, and everyone was like, what's your secret? I eat, I eat less now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because <laughs> I don't need to. I don't know, and, I'm being told uh, how much to eat. Yeah, yeah, but uh and but you know, if you can keep it as simple as that as I need this food to get to this goal, um but it you know, inevitably gets tied in with emotions, especially if you're on a in a caloric deficit. So, yeah. if you are battling hunger for long enough, I think um it it will definitely take longer to find a normal relationship with food after that. How much how much uh, I'm just curious because of the the advent of social media and all that. How, how much should the fans know about all this? You know, it, it's it's really just if you if we start to see athletes as people, you know, I think yeah. that's a lot of the problem is it's a commodity. You know, I always uh, think of that scene in Gladiator. Um, you know, when you've got yeah. the the you know, with uh, and I'm blanking on the actor's name where he's holding his thumb, you know, to the side and he gets to decide, and it's all so catered to the mob um, that. I think just the more awareness and the more, you know, we do the same thing with actors. Um, You know, everyone, uh, you know, wants to hold them to the certain standard. Never, you know, we're we're people. So, you know, actors, everyone is just a person trying to live their lives. And I think for athletes, especially as you're in Olympic sports, when you're trying to cultivate a social media persona, um, it's just getting that, that larger picture um, as uh, just for, um, you know, just empathizing with uh, the athletes that it's, um, you know, it's, it's a choice. That's first and foremost, right, is yeah, recognizing yeah. that we all choose this lifestyle. So by no means should anyone be feeling bad for an athlete, but also recognizing that uh, it can take a toll physically and emotionally on athletes. And so I think the more the public understands that, ideally that then transfers to sponsors and you know, if we can somehow shift this culture where we value athletes as people, then that's going to help bring more money in and keep money into the life cycle. So rather than having access to services only at the time that you're valuable and competitive, um, making sure that athletes are taken care of when they're done in that transition, whether it's with injuries or school, um, you know, whatever is going to help them live a normal life after whatever normal is. (laughs) Yeah. Well, yeah, I was going to say normal is relative term. Yeah. Because so and every athlete has different experiences. That's the other. I mean, there's no, I mean, people that do sliding sports are completely different than ice skating sports versus, you know, the pentathlons and all that. I mean, yeah. And that's the cool different... thing about being on the athlete council is, you know, at our, we meet three to four times a year and you're hearing the issues of all these wildly different sports. And, um, you know, kind of like the government, you can't possibly ever expect to come to a consensus when everybody is coming from, you know, such different uh, backgrounds, different sports, you know, the needs of a, a uh, biathlon athlete are going to be very different than a track and field athlete. Um, small sport versus big sport, yeah. um, dep- the amount of money coming in. It's, uh, it's really fascinating. The, the ver- so even though all of that varies, the one thing that we do see that's in common is the need for mental health assistance as well as uh, transition assistance. It's it's just athletes across the board from Michael Phelps on down um, are not feeling good about their experience typically afterwards. Yeah. Right. Yes. Well, uh, yeah. Yeah. As an ex-athlete, I just wonder if if you, if you build it up, you know, so much in your head that if I do this, 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 and this, I'm going to have this wonderful, great experience. And then if it changes or doesn't happen exactly like that, 
how do you deal with it? And that's yeah, that's and one I thing mean, they... the fact is, I had a blast. Like I had so much fun, and you know, maybe part of that is when you experience something that's so intense and incredible, like competing at the Olympics and standing on a start line and knowing the world is watching, and that's you know such an emotional high that of course there's an inevitable low after that but I think the key is not continuing to seek that feeling out being able to say that was great and what else am I going to do that's great in a different way yeah that's I I think you're right I think a lot of athletes suffer, suffer with that yeah, it's it's tough trying to um, find your value and your self-worth afterwards if it's all tied into physical performance. You know, sports allow you to consistently try and, approve, uh, to try and prove something, prove it to yourself mostly. Um, and I think I, I tend to think of um, athletes are really, you know, their own biggest critic. And a lot of us are, are driven by this firm belief that nothing you do will ever be good enough. And so then while you're in sports, you get to constantly try and prove yourself wrong. Like, what about this achievement? What about this achievement? And then after you're done, you have to find you, that's when you then have to come to terms with that and, um, and figure out, you know, not only what to do, but, um, but how to feel, I guess. Well, the way, the, the reason my, my podcast is called the travel wins but I travel so much for my work, and I would literally, I mean, I, you know, I, I drive because I have samples in my car. So, you know, driving from L.A. to San yeah. Francisco is a six, seven, eight-hour drive, depending on the route. And yeah. All that. And I would sense at seven hours on average thinking about, oh, my God, I, I've got to, okay, I've got these appointments set up. I've got to make this much. How much money, you know, I can go, I, I need to make $10,000 in sales per, per visit or whatever. You know, it's I'm thinking, okay, I've got gas, food, hotel. Blah 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 blah, and I would just get kind of stressed out about it. So what I started doing was taking a lot of photos when I drive, and ah. that's how it all got started. Because it would instead of just sitting there concentrating on how much I need to make this this week, is I'm like, hey, well, I, maybe on the way back if the sun's setting differently, and I could, and then I would pull over and talk to people and and, and talk to their ranch and say, hey, can I take some pictures of this windmill or? You know, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And living, took, living life while you are normally what might be considered in between time, not allowing yourself yeah. to have in between lifetime, having it all be lifetime. Exactly. So now That's really I, cool. I, I started posting a lot of photos and I was traveling. I, I went to like 35 states, 34 states in just a few years uh, for my work. And yeah, I would go to places and they go, hey, did you see this? I'm like, no, because I used to just schedule, hey, I'm going to show up at this time, go to work go to dinner, go to work, and then come back home and fly home. Yeah. I would book no time to go see things. And I, I find and now I have the podcast, which is, you know, oh, turning into work. And uh, yeah. But it's fun because I'm thinking about that now. And I'm not just – and my sales have actually gone up because of – I don't know, uh-huh. because of, but I'm not so overstressed and analyzing everything I do with my job because I'm yeah. thinking about other things in my life. Yeah, even, even if you wanted to make that, say, tangible science, um, you are making decisions less stressed, and so you're yeah. making um, decisions with more of your wits about you um, at the very least. And, you know, and thinking in terms of, you know, positively what's going to add, you know, to your life, that's that's really cool. I had the uh, the same thing happen, basically, the the – the beauty of coaching now is I just felt a bit guilty um, while I was competing. You know, I I spent my, one of my go-tos for recovery was sleeping, napping, you know, especially if you're getting your head down the track and you spent some time cold. (laughs) Um, So I always felt my brakeman would go to have coffee with other international athletes or they'd go and do some sightseeing. And when I was done, that was one of the things I looked back. I was like, man, I really did not go and see those places as much as I could have. So the great thing about coaching now is I've committed to, um, you know, not only in those places that uh, that I've gotten to go to, whether it's all the different um, the winter resort towns of Germany or Norway or Italy um, and France, is you know, uh, promise myself that I'm going to go do something while I'm there, no matter how tired or jet lagged I am. Uh, but also try and go early or stay longer to add some bucket list item. So I had a meeting in uh, Lausanne for the World Anti Doping Agency last spring, and I was like, all right, I'm going to tack on the Amalfi Coast. Um, to this, which was, you know, shoulder season, um, and it was perfect timing and got to see the whole thing. And, uh, and, and the nice thing about wintery sports and winter travel is you're typically in the slow season, unless of course you're in a ski town, which yeah, is bonkers. 
homelessness over it. Cause I, I lived in Tahoe for a little bit. Oh and, yeah. And Tahoe in the winter was Holy Christ. And then like it's from spring, summer and the early fall when there's no snow, it was great. There was no one around. Yeah. Yeah. And as soon as you got first snow, you're like, okay, let's get everything. You know, but yeah. everyone else have fun while we just keep working. Yep. We're headed to, um, We've got, oh, I'm commentating a uh, luge race in Whistler that same week that uh, the slopes open. <laughs> so that yeah. always makes it, uh, typically we'll try and do those, um, that because we, there, our North American tracks are Whistler, BC, Park City, Utah, and Lake Placid, New York. And so uh, anytime those races are scheduled during ski season makes it a bit difficult. Yeah. And Which, expensive. Yeah. That's a whole difference. <laughs> When when you're traveling now versus when you're an athlete, and and now with the advent of of your, you know, I'm sure you're on a smartphone. Um, yeah. What do you? How do you fill up your time versus oh, uh, or even back then? Was it music? Yeah, was it, it movies? Reading? Oh, uh, we used to prior to Netflix. Um, the big <laughs> thing that you would do, you know, to prepare for the season is we would all uh, download shows and most people were pirating them in one way or another. And so our team would get into different seasons of shows every year, um, which was always funny. So, uh, you know, nowadays I'm not, you know, the, you get a little bit limited when you're streaming Netflix, but that was something uh, and Pop said we were highly dependent on. And then the nice thing now traveling uh, with uh, with Bobsled, you bring so much stuff, like so much of it is tools and equipment um, and just you're lugging around bags upon bags. And so I've kind of taken it to an extreme, but the luxury of not needing that equipment anymore, I try really hard to, even if I'm gone for a month long trip, I'll try and put, you know, condense everything into a carry on. Um, but that said, that challenge isn't worth it if it's all some very intricate Tetris puzzle that you have to do it, so you have to yeah. repack at every stop and you just make yourself miserable. Yeah, I'm saying. I mean, I'm, I, I, I've learned to become a lighter packer. I, yeah. I pretty much know now how many pairs of socks I need to bring. What you know, and there's a couple trips where I've gone. Oh, I wish I would have brought this or that, but for yeah. the most part, I've done so much now. I'm just like, man, I got it. Yeah. One of the games I'll play is um, after the first trip. I'll play this elimination game where after the first trip of the season, anything I didn't wear gets is not allowed to come on the next trip. And, you know, there's a little, Mm. there's a few variables there depending on where you go. So like if I'm coaching and staying in an Olympic training center, you know, I'm going to bring more workout clothes because I have the opportunity to work out more. Um, But for the most part, um, it is surprising what you can limit things to. The the trip I've got coming up, though, now is an interesting one because I'm coaching para bobsled. Uh, I leave on Sunday to go coach the uh, U.S. trials for para bobsled and para skeleton in Lake Placid um, out of the track there. But then I have a world anti-doping. I'm the U.S. athlete rep to the world anti-doping conference in Poland. Um, so then, you know, oh, wow. trying to figure out, you know, what between and then after that, there's a national governing bodies. Um, there's a symposium in Anaheim after that. So now we've got different weather. We've got business meetings. We've got, you know, so I think I'm just going to uh, deal with the cold and not waste space with snow pants <laughs> <laughs> on this one. And uh, and it's just and a lot of times you can be, I'm hoping maybe I can borrow from someone. But I, need to, I really don't want to bring boots because that takes up yeah, some okay, precious yeah. space there. And then, of course, bringing snow pants and boots, lugging it all through Anaheim and L.A. is um, it would be annoying. So, so you're not distracted. you're going you're you're going to to New York to, straight to Poland and then straight to Anaheim. Yep. Yeah, this is oh, a, a really weird one. So you know, I try and repeat, uh, especially if I'm doing athlete representative stuff. I can get away with the same outfit um, yeah. for uh, you know a season if they're all different meetings. Just you know, pick one go to business um, attire um, outfit. But the weather change will be interesting in Anaheim. So well, yeah, we yeah. Are, we are we are in the 90s of past week, but it is supposed to cool down into like oh, 70s, wow. 80s. Oh, that'll feel good though. I could use some vitamin D. That's uh, you definitely um, look for sunshine. There, most winter, most of our bobsled and skeleton athletes will typically try and find some place sunny to train in the off season because you don't need the tracks are closed. Sure. You don't need to be near a track. You know, ideally you get some push time at a push track. Um, so that's why I trained. Uh, in Scottsdale, my last season yeah. competing, I'm discovering you, know, you recover so much better. There's a reason people retire there. Your body yeah. feels so much better. You don't have to do 
uh, way less for recovery, especially I trained at the Olympic Training Center in Colorado Springs for a while, and being at altitude is not great for strength sports. Really? Yeah, you have to work so much harder to recover. Uh, So the time that I was spending, whether it was in the ice tub or there's these um, pants called Normatec that kind of, it's like a squeegee for the fluid in your, yeah, to um, compression, um, all all of the different, uh, you know, dry uh, dry needling is another interesting um, technique that I was a fan of, that you're stimulating the muscle and kind of geeking it out enough that it'll be forced to uh, relax. So all of that I found I didn't need in Arizona because my body just felt so much better there with the with the dry heat. Yeah, and that's exactly. of course until until June I would just been singing a different tune if we stayed there after June. <laughs> uh, yeah, and, yeah, I was born in Phoenix, so and my parents yeah. came from from Cleveland, Ohio, and so yeah. most a lot of my relatives were like, "Oh, we can move from Ohio? We're out." <laughs> you know, so yeah. my aunt, my aunt moved to Dallas. My my uncle moved followed his brother my dad to, to phoenix you know yeah like no 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 we don't have to sleep in, in cleveland let's, let's get out and dry out and yeah. warm up yeah i mean the the name of the game in sports is recovery right so when when we yeah. talk about athletes doping and using drugs most of those drugs just allow the athletes to recover faster so then they can hit um their training harder sooner uh, so it's all about figuring out, you know, how to um, adapt and, and recover the best possible. And so I guess where that ties into travel as well is learning how, you know, they always schedule one of the most difficult tracks in the world right after Christmas because they knew that the North Americans would come over just, you know, holiday Flabby, sluggish and mm-hmm, well-fed. Yeah, yeah so uh, th- just trying to, you know, learning all the different ways to um, hit the ground running and especially in those long-haul flights. I know – People talk about it a lot these days, but compression socks are critical. Not letting that fluid accumulate um, in your lower legs, um, that was a huge discovery for me and just how much better my workouts felt, felt that day. Um, let, let, let me ask you this question because I, I, you just kind of twisted my brain there. Do you <laughs> still wear those when you go? Like when you go to Poland, will you wear compression socks? Just to... Yep. Yeah. I, I, I surprise myself if I don't wear them. Like if okay. I'm on a short flight, say that from Seattle to El to LA maybe I won't um, because you just generally feel so much better especially because you're not it's not just the time on the plane it's the amount of time that you're sitting in a car to the airport um, travel is stressful and you know and it's taken a while for me to realize that it's not just my own stress it's being surrounded you know and then put in a microwave with other people's stress and so it's just trying to mitigate all the little things that are going to that contribute to that sensory overload you know whether it's you know yeah, physical yeah. fatigue um, or, you know, hydration packets that Costco started selling hydration packets that I found have helped, um, for mid flight. Uh, and then, um, and also just, you know, showering once you land and just rinsing off all of the, uh, you know, yeah. the, the, just the, the, the travel. The yeah. And you know, a lot of people say like work out as soon as you land, but I've never been able to do that. Like that is nuts to me because you're so tired. Like, I'll typically maybe sauna that evening to get my, you know, that will help with uh, especially European jet lag. I'll try and, you know, sauna and get a really good sweat going, help myself adapt. And then maybe when I'm up early the next morning, go for a workout and pretend that I'm a morning person for the day and think that it will last forever. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, this is great. This is going to last forever. I'm going to stay a morning person. (laughs) And then not so much. No. <laughs> and then something well, interesting is on Netflix. It's done. Sometimes, sometimes uh, may, maybe I'm wrong, but I remember seeing some of the uh, sliding sports at nighttime. Yes, that's the other. Oh, man. At the Olympics uh, in 2010, they added an extra training day um, because there was, there was a tragic accident um, prior to opening ceremonies where a luge slider um, – uh, crashed in the finish curve and died. And so they added an extra training day um, for the rest of sliding sports to try and mitigate the, the danger there. But they had us – and it, the Olympics is the Olympics. You just deal with it because everyone yeah. else is on the same schedule. But um, it was an evening session. The skeleton race had gone late. So we started training, I think, at like 9.30 or 10 p.m. So you've got all that adrenaline going in your system too. And we almost missed the last shuttle back to the Olympic Village. We got back at like midnight – 12:30, and then had a turnaround for early morning training the next day, um, and so that it mostly just interrupts you know your sleep. Like you're gonna get nervous, you're gonna get amped up regardless when it's performance. 
but it's figuring out how to still get some, some sleep in. And at the time I was highly dependent on uh, coffee was my performance enhancing drug of choice to get myself <laughs> alert. And so of course, drinking coffee at 9 PM and then getting up in the morning doesn't go well. Yeah, not at all. You know, and, and a lot about, about, I don't know about a lot, but several bodybuilders I've, I've met and t- talked to and know you, you drink coffee like on the yeah. regular. And they're so particular about everything else they put in their body, but they drink coffee. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, it to a certain degree, at a certain amount, it does become illegal in anti-doping. Uh, there's a certain amount of caffeine that passes the threshold, and then you'll get popped. Um, but for the most part, it's, you know, such uh, – it's a legal drug that um, helps with – I think they've shown that it helps Just more with endurance athletes, but for me, as a fo- it helps with focus and alertness, right? So as a driver, I wanted to feel as alert uh, and with it as possible. Yeah, yeah, and and it was legal. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So. And it's also a matter of feeling good. So, like, I know for Brakeman, you know, their their job is mostly the first 30 meters of the run and then um, pulling the brakes at the end. So, you know, even if uh, they they just have those two heavy 30-meter sprints, you know, they'll drink a lot of energy drinks just to feel good and feel ready. And get the pop. Do, yeah. Do they Are they putting uh, GoPros or anything like that in the sleds now? We've we tried that once. Uh, and yeah, they actually at the last Olympics they made everyone retrofit their sleds, um, cut into the fiberglass to put a GoPro and a camera on the front of the sled, okay. so that the the Olympic broadcast system, OBS was able to use that um, at will uh, to splice into the broadcast. Uh, another interesting angle that we've uh, we put GoPros inside the sled so you can see the drivers driving. That's what I'm saying. Um, That's what I'd like to see. I mean, yeah, you can see where, uh, but the problem is, it's just you. The the most telling aspect of it is you see how violent the ride is because the camera's just shaking the hell around. You know, it's really hard to even completely stable. You just see any little bump in the ice. You know, it, it's hard to get ice glass smooth. Uh, in Ultimate yeah. Germany, they're experts at it. Um, but for the most part, it's it's you know the ice is bumpy. You take hits and that's bumpy. Your transitions can be bumpy depending on how you approach a corner. So it's really that it definitely shows how violent the ride can be. I'm pretty sure there would there there's some uh, videos on YouTube of times that we've done that. And it was funny. One of my teammates was an avid video game player. That's um, he kind of uh, attributed uh, a lot of his skill to how much he played video games. And what was hilarious is then when they put the camera inside the sled, um, even though you're holding, you're just holding a D ring, right? So it's just yeah. it's a handle that's shaped like a D. But his thumbs were moving like he was playing Starfighter or something. Uh, his thumbs were tapping up and down on the D rings. It was hilarious. And, and th- I wonder, and that's probably just a, a tick that he had. Right, right. Yeah, and I'm not sure why Starfighter was a video game I chose. Um, but it works. We'll, back to the 70s. <laughs> we'll, we'll put a reference, <laughs> a reference in the uh, description uh, of the podcast episode yeah. to explain what Starfighter is. The, yeah. I, do, I do that so many times. I do even with my daughters. You know, my daughters are 24 and 25, and yeah. I'm like, oh my god, I don't feel old until I talk to them or hang out with them for a little bit. Yeah, that was so a weird I'll, thing I'll bring about. Bring stuff up and go. Oh, never mind. <laughs> Um, as I stayed in the sport longer and longer, I always thought of that Matthew McConaughey uh, quote from Days and Confused. Um, you know, the thing about, I like about bobsled is the brakemen stay the same age. You get a lot of young brakemen <laughs> as I'm getting older, and then suddenly, all of a sudden, there's this disconnect when they have no idea what I'm talking about, and I'm totally in a world of my own. Yeah. Like, oh, man. Never mind. Yeah, never mind. And you get that, all right, all right, all right. Irrelevant, yeah. I told someone to watch 16 Candles um, the other day because that was one of my favorite movies, uh, and I told him to watch it with his niece, and he uh, messaged after, and he was like, "Do you?" this was a British uh, a British guy, and he was like, do you realize how racist that movie is? Yeah. <laughs> Inappropriate. I'm like, oh, man, I didn't really think of that. There was, there's, a, there's a lot of things that are like that. If you, if you go back and watch it, oh, yeah, they couldn't make that today. Yeah. Oh, they like, couldn't oh, make that man. today. Poor taste. Yeah. But, yeah, you know, sure. you, my wife, she'll, hover, she'll be like, hey, you need a Jake moment. And I'm like, all right, I know what you mean. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. She, she loved that movie, too. So. Yeah. So, anyway, <laughs> I appreciate the time, and I, I feel like I, I ate up more of your time than I 
than you were probably hoping for, but uh, no, I I'm love, just like uh, I said, I love flying sports. Packing game. Oh, yeah, and it's and it's rare that we find someone that's not involved in sliding sports or a parent that loves sliding sports. So that's a big deal. Um, we definitely want to keep people like you in, engaged, and and it's it's tough. You know, I was on the I was an athlete representative to the board of directors for USA Pops and Skeleton for the last five years, and that's the constant question: is how do you engage? You know, uh, people that this, this is totally irrelevant to. So definitely always trying to come up with ideas and um, sports. Yep, those niche sports, they're a tough one. Another question for you real quick. Could I just think yeah. about that? I know you got involved with, with Skeleton because of your brother, Tim. Yeah. But why didn't you pick luge where you control with your where the feet are out front? Why, I mean, was it just like, oh, well, that's my brother's test. I want to do it. Or, I mean. Um, so luge, it, it's interesting how uh, vastly different those worlds are. So because luge has – the sharpest runners, they call them Kufin. So their steels are actually angled and they have a blade hitting the ice. So luge yeah. takes the most training. So even though say my career might've been the same length as a lot of luge athletes, they start between five and 10 years old because you have yeah. to, it's really tough to learn it at adult height and weight. It helps a lot if you're just a kid. Yeah. And made a rubber and um, it just, it's so skill intensive that mistakes compound quickly and they compound in a very bad way. So uh, luge is just one of those sports that starts young and they can go through their forties. You see a lot of long luge careers. Um, It's a little bit friendlier on the body. They still have gnarly crashes, um, but you know, they, they're, they have less head, they still have head injuries, but a little bit less than skeleton and bobsled. So it's mostly just, you know, there was one um, gentleman that made an effort trying to see if he could go to the Olympics in doubles luge starting as an adult because the bottom guy uh, isn't able to see, so doesn't steer as much as the top guy. Um, but That's crazy. It's, yeah, it's just tough. So actually, to give you an example of how much speed can be found with the different corners when steer correctly, a doubles luge sled will go faster than a four-man bobsled because that's how much speed, uh, that's how technical sliding sports are and how much speed can be found in a corner. Uh, see, that, that's, again, that's, uh, maybe I'm just a geek. I think that's the kind of <laughs> stuff they need to talk about. Like, what yeah, are the big differences? Just, yeah, it's it's hard. It just you know the level the level of interest. You know, finding people that are curious about it and trying to figure out how to feed this to a bigger audience, but also get into the little nuances and, and nitty gritty. And the other thing, I, what I love about luge is they are. I, I don't know if it's nature or nurture. By the time you make it to the elite level, they are some of the most chill people on the planet. And yeah. I mean, if you figure starting at a young age, you know, you're you have to be co- totally calm. You know, same with skeleton. You want to be completely relaxed on your sled under the craziest of circumstances and so they're really really fun um athletes as a breed to hang around <laughs> well i, I, I want to send you the link one of the things i think that would be cool is uh they're the, the camera co- company i was telling you about um yeah the macau bungee jump well it's yeah. the 360 and the camera is all, it's only like four hundred dollars and huh. you can put it on on helmets and all that and and when you set it up it's so cool because you can, um, and no, I'm not sponsored by them. Um, <laughs> but it was just cool because I, I was thinking, like, if you could put it on a helmet of, of the skeleton, the luge, or the bobsled, and then when you put the 360 goggles on, you can t- look around. Like, Do we've tried that before? So you can remote control the camera and kind of pivot around? Um, no, this is just, like, it, it, it records in 360. Oh, that's cool. So then afterwards you can find whatever angle – so you yeah, so you're you're looking straight, yeah, uh, as a, as a driver, but as, as the person with the goggles on, I can look around. Yeah, and see everything that's that that's around. See, that's you. how you do the VR. Um, that's yeah, yeah, some virtual that's reality is. stuff. That's. I wonder if they've um innovated that yet. If you go, if you go on YouTube and look up POV. Uh, videos you can look up POV bobsled and you know that's a lot of how the athletes might train and visualize the athletes. So stick a camera on a helmet. We've been doing that for a while. Getting it to stay is you know can be an ordeal, um, but that would really add uh, to that VR. She, she, experience. Jumped, she jumped off a 1,200 foot tower. <laughs> wow! And I felt like yeah. I was in it. Yeah. Uh, and, and they've man. been doing it like with a lot of the um, um, uh, motorcycle riders and and that kind of thing. Yeah. Wow. 
Yeah, I wonder if if that would help because in just there's so much of Bob's that gets lost in translation because it looks smooth on TV and trying to yeah. you know it's really the best word to describe it is violent. Um, and so it's, it's completely it, violent. And not even yeah. the, the crashes are one thing, but I mean you, you you're literally bouncing. Yes, yeah, so all of the corners are vertical walls. And so even in a well-built track where they are shaping the ice really smooth and feeding corner to corner, you're still slamming up onto a wall, you know, at top speed. And depending on Lake Placid has really tight transitions at the top, um, which, which can rough you up. Uh, and so even on an ideal run, you're still, especially as a driver, you have a tight cowling for aerodynamics. And so your head is bouncing around on the sides of the sleds as you transition. You try and lean and mitigate it a bit, but you're still going to be slamming your head around and even the best case scenario. And that's, again, all the stuff that usually isn't seen. Yeah. Yeah. So, I, I mean, maybe like as you're doing the virtual reality, um, if you're in just a, a washing machine sitting and it just set it to spin <laughs> cycle, <laughs> and that would help people understand here, I'll compare it here. So we yeah. <laughs> That's close. Now try this. That's yeah. more accurate. And, and, and add, you know, 90, 100 miles an hour. Yeah. And just Are the women doing the, the four, four, four person? Oh, that's or? a subject. Um, we have been trying. It's something, um, uh, I'll pat myself on the back a little bit here. I took the first foreign woman bobsled off the top of Lake Placid. It's just that classic case of, uh, how long does it take to prove that women can do something that it's not? Uh, it it's been difficult. They we tried oh, to have wow. it added to the next games in 2022, and it's been an ordeal. So because the men have always had two events, they have two medal opportunities with two man and four man, um, and so you know, and it's just the same arguments that have been used against women's sports and equality throughout oh, history. Oh my second. That people, yeah, it's. It's been super frustrating, so we pushed to have it added to the 2022 games, um, and instead they added women's monobobs. Not only did they say, no, you can't do what the men are doing, but you actually shouldn't be driving anyone else either. Um, and I get that it oh provides opportunity. So monobob means you're just it's just you're one yourself. person in the sled. You're by yourself, and you pull the brakes. The brakes are underneath you um, that you pull after the run. So it does. It's great for learning. We use it as a learning tool. Actually, para bobsled is mono bob um, because uh, in, we, you're able to strap the athletes completely. Uh, the only classification yeah. for para bobsled right now is seated, and so um, use Velcro to strap legs um, and hips into the sled in case they crash. And so it's it's great for that. And we have a launcher that launches everyone to basically the same velocity, so start times are really similar. Um, yeah. But uh, with on the women's side, it's it will in theory it can help recruit and bring more into the sport if cost is an issue, um, if the international federation provides them. But just to me, you know, the looks of it are so bad when the women are asking to do something and you're like, nah, no, nah, no, nah, here, just um, but, but, have this. But that's on top of you know, it's crazy. The, the, the IOC international sports are still a bit archaic in that sense. Like they lowered the women's weight limit for bobsled um, in order to attract smaller athletes because they felt like they were being exclusive because all the top athletes were so big and strong. And so now right. I'm watching the women's field um, starve themselves in order to make weight because, of course, the bigger and stronger you are, the better you're going to push a sled. And so now all those same um, incredible athletes like our in the U.S. Our top brakeman and our top driver um, can't slide together unless they diet down and starve themselves. So it's it's really yeah. crazy when the I'm, men I'm, don't necessarily have to do that. I'm kind of confused. <laughs> Going from from a, a a two person sled, which is a breaker and a, and a driver, to a yeah. four per, to a four person sled, which is two additional pushers, and then yep. Their, their 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 baggage weight in the middle, right? Uh, yeah, essentially. I mean, it's uh, it's funny that is kind of the premier bobsled namesake event event, and it's tricky loading that sled, especially because there's no, no, not a I, lot of. I, I'm not yeah. saying they're, they're they're definitely percent, but I mean, uh, how how could they even justify saying, well, we can't find two women that could help push and jump into a sled and then sit there? 
Yeah, I, it's, I think a lot of it too is in um, the promotion <laughs> of the sports and recruiting, and uh, wow. it's having a little bit. It's true, but the the thing that I'm trying to emphasize with the international federation is the men's side is struggling with numbers too. They're kind of pinning this on a women's thing, um, and if you if you are too adherent to tradition, you miss out on opportunities, and eventually those sports kind of fall to the wayside. So it's yeah. definitely time to innovate in sliding sports and not just do things in the traditional way. You know, a lot of the niche winter sports can be very Eurocentric. Um, and so in that sense, you know, it's, it's harder to come in with our American hero syndrome innovation. They don't want to hear it. <laughs> That's the, uh, you can tell I'm married with two, two adult daughters. Where I'm like, Hold yeah. On a Hold yeah. On. I know that. It it blows my mind, and it's constantly sports governance in general. I'm finding it leaves me scratching my head, going, "Wait a minute!" Uh, you, you just assume, especially just with with Title Nine and the equal opportunity yeah. for the most part that women have had in sports. It's crazy in Olympic sports when you still see um, some some just some old school sexism. <laughs> That's so not awesome. <laughs> no, no, it's uh, it's it's pretty frustrating, and you'll see, you know, in a lot of these um, the executive committees, you know, in international sports, it's still rare to see a female on there. Uh, it's 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 tough, but things are changing, and I think the U.S. is is pioneering that change a bit. I know that um, that would annoy foreigners a lot because we love to, th- you know, they think Americans love to think of ourselves as pioneers. But still, you know, if you're looking at equality and equal opportunity, we're the only nation that allow that actually has constitutional, um, uh, you're legally obligated, you have to have athlete representatives on every standing committee and board in the Olympic sports movement, which is uh, not the case for anywhere else in the world. They don't have athlete representatives with a vote on executive boards. So you know, as much as we might be ahead of the game on that front, it's still 20%. So if the athletes want one thing, you're still never going to win that vote at 20%. So yeah. it's it's a constant battle. See, uh, again, all the stuff. I know, I took, I took a real sharp turn there. <laughs> no, no, I mean, I, that's the stuff I – when I started the podcast, I'm like, man, I would love to talk to people. I only I only talk to people I want to meet and talk to. But I also yeah. try to I also try and set up the conversation more like if we were sitting on a plane, and, yeah. and I was like, "Hey, so what are you doing?" Oh, I'm on I'm on the bobsled. And I used to be on the plane. Like, oh shit, I got some questions for you. Yeah, yeah, and I mean the 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 in sliding sports, the first question we always hear is, "How did you get into that?" Um, you know, like most of the weird Olympic sports. And so a lot of my teammates have cultivated some like hard hitting 30 second answer. Like, all right, I'm going to tell you how I got into it. 30 seconds or less. I gotcha. Well, yeah, I mean, I found the long run. Do you, do you listen to podcasts at all? Yeah, I, that's definitely kind of my, my go-to now for travel along with um, some other weird kind of travel nuances. It just, it's, it's a great way to kind of feel like you're, you know, learning and gaining something out of your time on a plane and not just zoning out and watching a movie. But at the same time, travel is so stressful that oftentimes you don't even feel like learning. There's a reason we yeah. like to zone out. So it's either podcasts and I shouldn't admit this, but sometimes, uh, you know, when I'm just on sensory overload, I'll just listen to uh, the uh, Disney Pandora station. <laughs> and, like, <just> <laughs> chewed up feel good music. And I know that really doesn't like, it's not an accurate portrayal of me or who I am, but I grew up spending a ton of time. It, my parents took us to, you know, Disneyland and Disney World a lot, and it's just it's, it's feel good Disney musical music. I love that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I love it's a bit that. bizarre, and it's a funny thing to admit on a on a podcast when really nobody else knows that. Well, you know, the, uh, <laughs> I have a quote, uh, and, and I will not tell it to you, but I, I have a quote that I use quite frequently. It was just the first line of the Lion King movie. Yeah. When 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 uh, Iron says life's not fair. Yeah. When he's scarred and he's talking to his food. He's got the because people are like, oh that's not fair. I go life's not fair, is it? You see, yeah. I I shall never be king. Yeah, I mean so, it's really it's, it's I would say it's not my fault. Disney determines that. I was heck say. of a lot of our society. If you look at all the biggest names, you know, there's so often when I hear of a new celebrity and I'm like, who the heck is that? Of course, it's a Disney star, a former child Disney star. Like they're a huge shape on our culture. Well, 
and you know now that they own ABC and yeah everything else that they own and yeah. Well, I, I ran this by my wife. Let me ask you this: You are a big foodie. Yeah. Yeah, you know, with the keto and, and bakeries and you know, being a baker and all that. Because she always goes, why, why are you eating, like, if I want to eat eggs for lunch or dinner? And she's like, that's breakfast food. And I go, who says that's a breakfast food? Like, who, who decides that pancakes are a breakfast food or bacon or whatever? You know, why yeah. is that a breakfast food and not a lunch food and not a, like, how did that ever become? Yeah. It's, uh, I've, ever since I was a kid, I've loved breakfast for dinner. Breakfast was my, was my favorite meal. And then yeah. since performance dieting, especially keto when you're intermittent fasting, then, you know, breakfast has been off the menu. I still use that a bit as a tool. I'll have some, um, fatty coffee and try and wait a bit for solid food. So especially in that instance, then that's breakfast can be, uh, any other time. And so, and the thing about eggs is they, uh, digest, uh, quite easily, far easier than, um, you know, animal protein meat. So uh, in a, in that sense, they might be ideal in the evening time because especially if you're eating late, they're going to digest faster than a big steak or any sort of um, meat portion. That's just going to rot in your gut. But, I mean, just, yeah. I think it's, all, it's all cultural. It's kind of like what you're saying with Disney, you know. It's like yeah. we, we were raised that, you know, you're going to have milk, orange juice, you know, toast, pancakes, bacon for breakfast. And yeah, you'll have regular food or whatever for lunch and dinner. I'm like, hold on. Yeah, so. which is odd too when you think about it, like sugar and fat. If you look at you know uh, the standard American indulgent breakfast, all that's made for is to send you right back to bed. You know, that's yeah, such absolutely. an exhausting thing to start your uh, day with. It's or at least at least for me anyway, I'm a bit carb sensitive, and so if I want to take a nap, I'll have some oatmeal and it'll help me nap. <laughs> I know for sure. Really? Yeah. Knocks me right out. Oatmeal, especially if it's cooked oatmeal, then it um, hits your blood sugar a bit faster. So you'll have that a little bit spike and crash. And so for a while, that was kind of my evening, uh, part of my evening recovery. Oh, now you're blowing my mind again. Yeah. Yeah, it is It is interesting when you just, you know, re-look at all those foods. And then one of my other favorite pastimes is when I was on those strict performance diets is um, just toying with recipes and figuring out how to make the foods I was craving in the parameters of that diet. And so you can, um, you can make a lot work a surprising amount, but you know, if I'm going to step back and, you know, say from a broader perspective, uh, just, you know, dieting in general is such a tough mentality. And, you know, some people, uh, it's just interesting that we would force ourselves to do that, especially perfectly healthy people when a lot of uh, people don't have the choice, you know, if you're diabetic um, or if you have food sensitivities uh, it's or if you develop food sensitivities, um, it's not fun. And so I think, uh, you know, as I'm learning to have a better relationship with food after all of that dieting and, um, you know, accept that uh, you can't expect your body to always look or search for your peak condition and your peak shape. Um, it's just, you know, cutting yourself some slack and saying, you know, and not. It's okay. the, yeah. yeah. The more I say no to food, especially in a uh, like kind of a, a guilt way or in a shameful way, like, oh, I shouldn't have that or I shouldn't do this. Um, that typically will lead to some sort of binge or, you know, things kind of fall out on the back end. So, you know, it's just, it's, it's there's a reason people talk about moderation. <laughs> you know, moder- yeah. moderation is great. If you, if you restrict yourself too often, um, you, you know, it makes it so, and it's a waste of energy too. Um, so like, you know, if you only, if you only have healthy options in your house, good nourishing food that will make you feel good, but every once in a while you might have a craving because maybe you're stressed or you've been in a caloric deficit and didn't know it. Um, and then, you know, go, go get some Thai food, go get, uh, some ice cream. I'm lactose intolerant, but I'll still eat ice cream if it's like my brain is saying it is ice cream time. It's worth the pain. Well, and you're not, I mean, well. Don't take this wrong way, but you're not a, a Olympian, Olympic level athlete anymore. But you're still, you know, trying to make the best out of it. And I think that's what's well, it's trying to transition to a place of not seeing food as a tool, but recognizing that the most grown up thing I could do is try and feel good. You know, and that's then yeah. in all aspects of life. It's the thoughts that I'm thinking. It's the environments that I'm putting myself in. It's how I react to those environments. And, and food is a big part of that, recognizing that if I'm going to these meetings, uh, it's exhausting to try and eat on some diet. Just eat the food that's there. You're tired. You're stressed out. Um, you know, when it gets a bit fatiguing if I've been on the road a while, but eventually I get home and then I look forward to cleaning things up a bit and feeding my body what I know is going to make it feel better. Yeah, see, and I have to do the exact same thing. 
you know, yeah. I, coming up in December, I, I work at the rodeo uh, in Las Vegas, and it's oh, cool. sixteen to sixteen to seventeen days while I'm there sleeping in yep. a hotel room. Yeah, yeah, you know, it's tough. And, so yeah, and so every, literally every meal is eating out. You know, which so. is fatiguing on your guts. Like there is, um, I've I've cooked in a restaurant. Um, there's a reason restaurant food tastes so good, and it, unless you can eat really high quality restaurant food that's um, cooked with high quality in high quality oils, that you know that food tends to be a bit uh, fatiguing on your system. And it definitely, you know, when I was competing or really on a strict diet, I would I went to so much effort to maybe pack an entire week's worth of meals in some sort of cooler that I made ahead of time. Um, but like, who's, who's got time for that? And I think, you know, for me now, if rather than trying so hard to protect some healthy lifestyle um, out of fear and, and guilt, say, all right, there's going to be food there, first of all, that is available for purchase. <laughs> you know, And also you you get to try new things in the different places that you go to. And so uh, like in Korea, we had one day off um, at the Pyeongchang Olympics and managed to make it to the coast from our mountain venue. And there's all these seafood restaurants lining the coast and uh, got to try. And I made, I made a point to try every single uh, option on that seafood platter, not having really any idea what most of it was. Um, it's just so much a part of the the fun of travel. And especially for me, it's just uh, the, the most magical thing when I got to Korea was seeing the breakfast spread. Um, <laughs> and seeing, you know, what what certain things had been like there was uh there was southern barbecue available, like ribs. It was oh, really wow. interesting. Like some corn yeah, it was it was a fascinating spread, but also the biggest bucket of kimchi I've ever seen in my entire life. <laughs> yeah, breakfast buffets are probably my number one favorite thing of, of traveling is the different countries and, and the breakfast spreads. Which makes about, it difficult if you're on a, like an intermittent fasting thing. Yeah, I was gonna say, and if you're on a keto, how hard is that keto diet? To, to, I mean, as as a I, norm, would you be able to do it now as a normal person just having a day job? And you know, I think the biggest problem is when you're getting into ketosis. So there's a roughly a 21 day period, and you are, I think. Low carb is like you don't discover the true meaning of low carb until you're doing keto where you actually have to look at the amount of carbs in broccoli. Like it's so extreme. Um, and I think it can be a great tool, but it just means that uh, it makes it harder to travel and find healthy options when you really are, you know, having to keep specific um you know, when you're having to watch what vegetables you eat, you know, like any diet, once you get into it, um, I think it's great for a reset, especially for a physical reset, uh, and for, for brain health and, you know, potentially people that are worried about inflammation in their brain, that is the best I've ever, ever felt. Um, and I think there was a lasting effect on that, but, um, I think, I think as far as travel goes, you don't want to miss out on stuff, you know? So I would say, you know, you can do do some intermittent fasting that will have a lot of positive effects where you just give your digestive system a break. Um, yeah. You know, I try and wait 12 hours at minimum between my evening meal and my next solid meal. And then from there, you know, if there's some awesome breakfast spread, I'm not used to eating in the morning, but I'll go for it because I want to miss it. Like my kind of, I, maybe it's time to get away from that leave no food unturned um, mentality. <laughs> it's just like a human garbage disposal going around trying stuff. When I was cooking at my friend's restaurant, uh, Catelli's up in Northern California, uh, it's in Geyserville, and it's the best food on the planet. My friend Dominica Catelli is a celebrity chef. And I was talking about culinary school after I retired, and she said, hold on, wait, you know, you don't even know if you'll like it. Come work for me and see if you like it first. And one of my big things since I retired is food waste. And so if there was an order gone wrong, everybody knew to give me that order because I would eat it. Uh-huh. And I had this very pivotal moment in my evolution where someone ordered just a, it was a salad mistake, and it was just a stupid salad and they handed it to me they're like all right Brie, here's your lunch and i said no that sounds no. stupid <laughs> 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 and i realized you know it's garbage either way whether i eat it or not so yeah um, so like being a being a bit picky about what you put into your body but also not missing out on on opportunity to try something new so i mean if, if you are doing keto for a medical reason or an experiment yeah. you know by all means it's possible to do while traveling but as you know it just it can add to the stress of travel which is already stressful so why do that to yourself and that's 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 for me that's where it gets to like i try to eat clean i try to eat healthy yeah. and, you know live it as much as possible if, if at all any of the fast foods and and all that 
but at the same time, I, you know, it, cause I, I've, I've been doing, I was kind of doing the intermittent fasting without even trying to. It was just like, okay, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to eat in the morning just because I'm supposed to. And that kind of gets back yeah. into the cultural thing, you know, like why am I eating breakfast food, you know, anyways. But all of a sudden it's like, you know, if it's 12 o'clock and I haven't eaten yet and I had an appointment in the morning and I'm ready to go, it's like, oh, shit, man. I'm in Cap, California. Yeah. Know, population of 450 people. I'm not going to be picky about what kind of food I can find. No, no, yeah. it, exactly. So, um, I mean, I, the reason that we actually had started this keto experiment was in a strength sport, it's been shown to increase testosterone levels. That's where I had trouble with my estrogen mm-hmm. levels dropping sure. so bad. Um, and so, you know, it's, it, it's a great experiment if you are willing to um, endure the just total – there, the, that period of time when your body's adjusting, especially if you've never been on a low carb diet, I've never uh, felt more like a space cadet. Uh, my coach at the time asked me to write a blog for him, and I was like, "That's the meanest thing you could do is ask me to put sentences together while yeah. my brain, my body's adjusting to to zero carbs." But like, there was an instant, there was one specific practice where I felt nauseous. Uh, suddenly, I thought I was going to throw up, and I was like, "Oh, am I getting sick?" And it was just that transition over into ketosis, and at that point, you'll bounce in and out, and it is really effective for putting on mass than to do like starchy loads after um, weight sessions. But I did find, uh, and I know this isn't even on the subject of what we were just talking about, but I did find that that month of training, those 21 days of trying to, of strength training in going into ketosis, I did lose muscle mass. So that's fair warning. Um, I did get a bit weaker and I lost some explosive um, tissue and had to build back up after that. So it's, um, there's definitely some some give and take there. I also ended up uh, toxic on selenium as part of the diet. Oh, wow. My hair started falling out and my legs were going numb. And uh, I didn't discover it until a couple of my teammates me- me- teammates mentioned that they were losing their health hair too because, um, you know, you're getting towards like the seed is starting, you're getting more stressed out. And if the diet said um, celery and three Brazil nuts in the evening time pr- prior to bed because Brazil nuts can help, uh, nuts before bed can help increase testosterone as well. But if you're tired and you're hungry, three Brazil nuts can turn into nine or 12 every night. And that's <laughs> pretty much the highest concentration of selenium available. And before I knew it, uh, the hair was falling out. And <laughs> I was back in sports med getting blood tests going, all right, what the heck is going on? <laughs> and the what? trainer at the time was great. He's, I specifically remember him grabbing me by the shoulders and saying, you are killing yourself. I'm like, but I feel great. <laughs> Like, no, no, I'm good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So all, all comes back to moderation and what doesn't increase uh, stress levels while you're yeah. traveling. Like when uh, this hotel that we stay at in Norway, when um, my coach Per Bobsled there, it's got every possible um, version of salmon you could ever want, and so you know I'm sure as hell going to try all of it. Yeah, <laughs> time, time to go. Yeah, not that that's bad for you. So well, it's um, everything and and can be bad to you. You know, if you only eat salmon, it's going to be bad for you at some point. Yeah, thinking you found some new rule is kind of a great mistake. You know, yeah. oh, this is the world's healthiest food. This is my new rule. Like putting all these rules on ourselves and not, you know, humans evolve because we're adaptable and just keeping yourself adaptable and not thinking you need. Uh, my parents actually developed food sensitivities because. They, you know, they were sticking to a healthy diet and through years of working, they ate the same thing every day. And lo and behold, they did some blood tests later on and they had um, developed antibodies to this food that they had eaten consistently um, throughout their um, heavy working years. So, you know, in this age of trying to find things that are easy, it's just so important to vary. You know, there's a reason you're supposed to vary your workouts, you know, vary your diet. Um, Our body wants to adapt. It likes that kind of stress. And so our obsession with, you know, to, with making things easier and look, we're just, we're trying to lower the wrong kind of stress a lot of times. Yeah. Which is actually adding a different uh, uh, stress to you. No, it stresses I mean, your body out. Yeah. If it's only eating the same thing all the time, eventually, yeah, you'll, you'll um, build up some, uh, some antigens to it on top of what you might've already had some sensitivities to. And of course that depends on the quality of the food as well. Well, like I have a friend who's a, and, and he, he's a strict vegan. And yeah. It, so much so that he considers himself a Cheegan now because he has to take a, a um, epilepsy pill and it's made with cellulose. 
Huh. So because he has to take that pill with cellulose, he doesn't consider himself a vegan anymore because it's from an oh. animal base. Oh. But, but he has to take the pill to, to not have seizures. So that's wow. the trade-off. But he doesn't consider himself a vegan anymore. Yeah. But he I said mean, that. In... Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, he, was, he said 30 years ago, you know, when vegan was a bad term, basically. Yeah. Uh, it was, he would stress out because he, he was a musician. And, oh, and touring. Oh, that was so he, brutal. Yeah, touring. The, so he said, yeah, I, I'd have to go 20, 30 miles to, to a, like a major town to get food for myself. Because if, I, yeah. if they were doing fairs and that kind of show, a smaller show in small towns, they, they wouldn't have vegan food. Or yeah, even it's very more meant. acceptable now to yeah, oh, yeah, have, yeah. you know, so much more often people are really matter of fact about do you have any dietary restrictions? No big deal. Whereas, you know, even a few years ago, you're the asshole if uh, you're like, yep. yeah, I'm trying not to eat this or that. You yeah, know, even on my team, having people look over my shoulder. Yeah, so like you come back for the season shredded, suddenly everybody want, is watching every single thing you put in your mouth. You come down, yeah. you come back and you put down a great, um, 30 meter test and now everyone's watching what you're Why? doing yeah yeah, yeah how'd exactly. that happen yeah yeah so it's it's such a such a weird weird world and um you know and for all of us just trying to i mean diet fads have been around forever you know yeah. there's you know from low fat to all that stuff everyone's always looking for that it's amazing how fast that spreads through culture of the new thing you know a dance craze or a diet fad like that is you know two things that humans love well, it's I think just, with the social media, that's that's exactly right. I mean, yep, it blows up, and then you've got uneducated, not uneducated, but you don't necessarily have science-backed promoters of certain diets, yep, and yep. Uh, and it's just you know it can, it can be um, dangerous. And, and the bottom line is uh, just keep giving your body um, varying things that that serve it, and and also being in tune enough to not eat something because you're supposed to, but recognizing that it might not make you make you feel good or it might make you feel okay now, but in another time and you've ex- been exposed to different bacteria or different stressors or a different season in the year, it's going to affect it different. You know, there's a reason we crave different foods in the summer, um, of course, and at different times. And so, you know, well, it's the I, same with workouts. We, we talk about, uh, I've talked to my, my, my food friends about, you know, you aren't supposed to get citrus year round necessarily. Yeah, yeah. None of that stuff is bananas year round. It's not a natural thing. And it's also the same with workouts. Like it doesn't necessarily make sense to do the same workout routine. Even if you think you're varying it, you're varying it throughout the course of a week and that stays the same throughout the year. You know, it makes sense. There's a reason you want to be a bit more sedentary in the winter. You know, your body's conserving energy. Like if I'm standing outside coaching in sub 20, um, you know, like negative 50 degrees, you know, for five hours, I certainly don't come back and want to work out. Uh, I just stare at the wall for an hour and just try and come back to to normal. So oh, yeah, your you know, body's done everything it could to to stay alive. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly, exactly. So like you know, varying your workouts by season, I think, is important too. And just go based on yeah. Of course, you have to get yourself up and um, you know force a workout sometimes. But I also found if I just kind of rather than forcing things, if suddenly I felt a burst of energy for whatever reason, then my body. If you have the luxury and you can do that, then like, all right, now it's time to work out. Let's go do something. <laughs> or if I'm coaching next to a track, that just means a bunch of air squats or something or lunges. <laughs> yeah, we're just standing there. But yep, you had, to stay warm. Yeah, jogging in place. I say that. That's why I'm going to go outside today and enjoy my 82 degree weather. Oh, I'm <laughs> so jealous, man! I really, um, I'm, I'm, winter sports have left me at a deficit for sunshine in my life. Um, I, I agree. Yeah, I uh, my latest thing that I have not tested out is I'm I suddenly got I've been looking into those inflatable footrests that I think I'm going to get. I'll have it delivered to Lake Placid maybe and try it for the next trip. Well, you know, that might be my newest travel hack or it could be the next thing to that's too much of an ordeal to bring. But especially like if you're not super tall, I find it's really uncomfortable when your legs kind of slope down in the chair and you feel like you're falling off the seat the whole thing. Yeah. So um, I spent a while last night bringing a birthday present with me, and I packed it into a box that I just that I spent a while reinforcing so I could use that as my footrest to test out this trip. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they allow you to return things for me, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, but 
with my sudden idea, but it hit, and I don't. I leave tomorrow, and I didn't have enough time oh, to I Amazon gotcha. Prime, uh, an inflatable one. And I was checking around; there aren't any available. So I was like, "All right, well, we'll try making it uh, this go around. And if it's a go, then um, we'll we'll see if I, we can make." I, I, one thing I'd like to try, and I, I just haven't, is the the um, the inflatable thing that goes on your your food tray, where you can where you can sleep oh, leaning forward. Lean forward. Yeah, my only thing with that is then you're, as someone that's consistently bothered by people tapping the hell out of their seat back entertainment, um, you know, if it's your seat and they don't realize that it only takes a light pinprick of pressure and you're just getting poked in the back the whole flight, my only concern <laughs> there is, like, if you're rustling around on that seat tray, then you're bouncing the person's seat in front of you. It's the same thing. They make this little sling that you can put over your tray to, as a footrest as well. But, I mean, it's the same thing. If you're pushing your feet around or moving around, you're bouncing the person in front of you. So, I don't know. Um, unless you're, you know, able to pass out and not really move a lot, then. Well, that's sure. what I'm wondering. I mean, like, I don't know. Because when, when I when I sleep, because I, I always take a window seat. And yep, me too. I, I have to look outside. That's just my thing. But yep. uh, it's, I always find it interesting because, I yeah, I can sleep, but then like man, if I if I'm doing it hard, all of a sudden my neck's cranked and it's I can yeah. wake up not good. Yeah, yeah, especially as, as we get older, there's um, a bit more risk there. And so I've I started leaving the uh, neck pillow at home because I found that I was just adjusting it a lot. And yeah. the one thing I'll bring, even if I'm only have carry-ons, I have a down travel pillow that I got at IKEA years back. Um, that I take everywhere because I find if there's some things you can keep consistent, then I know I can sleep anywhere. Pillows are high risk. Like you can end up in, especially the small uh, Euro hotels that were there for sliding sports. Um, it's If I bring my own pillow, I know I'll be able to sleep well. And then I use that on the plane and it's so much added comfort, comfortive, even if you're just holding it. Um, that, uh, that's definitely the one thing that has um, stat in compression socks that have been c- consistent throughout the I'm years. I want to try the compression socks. I've, I've, I've seen Yeah, but I've they have to be that. like legit. Um, don't shop for cheap ones. You want to make sure that it's graduated compression. If they're built wrong, they'll actually pull the blood um, into your ankles, which is bad. They'll reverse compress. So you want to make sure you've got um, really high quality compression you socks. Scared the uh, they make me sports now. ones. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. I, I don't know. I've never bought them from like because obviously, uh, you know, people with diabetes need them, and you can find them typically if you walk into your uh, healthcare provider. They've always got them on the wall there. But I'm not sure if those. Um, but they got to be good. Be ones. My, my first choice, yeah. So uh, if you look up, especially you know, there's sports brands ones as well. The only downside I've found is uh, I would wear them for training too sometimes uh, in recovery if we were going to be at the track a long time, uh, and you end up wearing through the heels, unfortunately, which gets a bit uncomfortable. Smart wool has a wool pair, but I wore through those wicked oh, fast. That's right. You get the, 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 the warm ones, yeah. Yeah, and, but, and also know that they're a bitch to get on and get off. Um, <laughs> so my, dad, my parents left for a trip recently, and my dad um, hurt his back trying to get his compression sex, uh, socks on. Oof, that sounded terrible. <laughs> Rewind. Cut that out. His, his oh, I got his back uh, putting his uh, compression socks on because, yeah, the good ones are tight. Well, and they should be, right? I mean, that's what, – what, what's, uh, what's an average good price for a good pair? Uh, forty to fifty dollars. You know, the okay. the market's getting a little bit more flooded now, so they might have dropped to thirty. Um, and just you know, check out reviews and make sure they say graduated compression. Um, because I mean, you know, like you know that feeling when suddenly if you didn't take your shoes off and your shoes are tight at the end of a flight, yeah. you know, that's all that fluid building and uh, just pooling in your feet, and so it helps things circulate uh, to your you know more vital organs if you're not letting all the fluid pool to your feet on a flight. Yeah, that's going to be – I'm going to try it out and see. Cause that's, yep. And wear them around uh, um, first. Uh, but then, yeah, they can uh, – but even that, if you've got them on too long, sometimes that can be a bit fatiguing so pretty tight. Because I know my, my dad, when he had his knee replaced, they, they gave him the compression socks. So. Yeah, I mean, just in in general, um, like, if you know, you've got a really, like, sometimes if I've got a really long day, or like I said, when I was um, competing, if I knew we were going to be at the track forever, then I would train in compression socks that day just to help reduce fatigue. Oh, yeah. So is it, is it okay to, to walk and, and, and do things on them? 
Yeah, I mean, it's you know, if you're say you're in New York City and you've got days, you know, that's the the place that everybody will that will spend forever walking all you know miles farther than they ever would normally. Uh, they're great for something like that. You know, that fatigue, like Disney World fatigue, <laughs> where what? you've been on your feet all day and everything aches. They're they're great for that too. See, my, my, what I was saying is at the rodeo, I have to wear cowboy boots, and I always tell people yeah. cowboy, when cowboy boots were built, concrete did not exist. No. So, you, I mean, and if you're wearing a leather sole, I mean, now we're we're doing gel insoles, and, and I have rubber rubberized outsoles. But if I want to wear my nice Cayman boots that are leather soled, you know, after 12 hours on concrete, they, your feet hurt Ugh. after yeah. you know, 15 straight days. For sure. Uh, we I used to be sponsored by Home Depot, which was a great program. Um, they cut it prior to the Olympics in 2010. And I definitely feel you when I was trying to get in my workouts before and after, standing around on the concrete floors uh, for eight hours a day was, was rough yeah, on recovery. Sucks. Yeah, yeah, it's brutal. So I don't know. I mean, that you know, you've done what you can with the, with the gel insoles. Um, but, yeah, maybe some compression socks would help there as yeah, well. Nice. Yeah. You get the Can times you sleep I've in gone, them? Not comfortably. I've never, I mean, I'll sleep on a flight in them, but uh, you'll find that, you know, the comfort you're, you might be able to get used to them, but um, I have not. And okay. um, I have not even tried because something that you'll probably just uh, take off in the middle of the night. <laughs> yeah. It's also terribly comfortable. comfortable. I got you. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Well, but I try that for, for your long days and boots that might help out. Well, the other thing is, like you know, like I said, like, I'm driving to Northern California, so all of a sudden I'm sitting yep. driving Long for drive. seven hours. Yep, yeah. I mean, it's not like it's going to, you know, drives are fatiguing re- regardless, but um, yeah. it's definitely I I wear them on long car trips for sure. You you just made my day. Yeah, cool. Um, I'll see if I can send you some links. Uh, there was a company um, that sent me some free socks prior to the last Olympics. Uh, it's 